greetings of peace be upon you all. Uh, praise be uh, to God uh, this uh, this morning in uh, in UK and uh, evening in uh, Malaysia. Uh, we welcome you to the seventh session or seventh uh, seminar on the the book of certainty by Dr. Martin Lings. And we have, as usual, our uh, commentator, our beloved commentator, Dr. Reza Shah Kazmi, uh, to bring us through. I think we are uh, at chapter two, if I'm not mistaken. Hey, we are. We are indeed. We are yes. chapter two. Okay. Um, so uh, without further ado, I, I uh, leave it to you, uh, Dr. Reza. Um, well, actually, I was going to say, would you like to read? It's it's a short chapter. It's not like we've taken so long on, on chapter one, but this is only a few pages. So shall we start by uh, having you read, let's say, until, well, in my edition, there's a sort of natural breaking point, uh, which is just before we start talking about the date as the, the gardens, that's on page 15 in my edition, which is one, two, three and a half pages. So basically nearly towards the end. But I think it's good to stop there before we go into the question of the date. Uh, what do you think? Would you prefer to read the whole of the four and a half pages? It's all right. I mean, uh, I can read it because it's only a, a short. It is. Paragraph to, towards the end. Yeah. Until the and end. Before of, we, until the end of the chapter. Before we, before we start, I've just got to say, I, I thought that when you said, praise be to God, in the morning in UK and in the evening here in Malaysia, I thought you were going to say this is a perfect uh, sabab nuzul for subhanallah hina tumsoon wa hina tusbihoon. That's right. Which, for the sake of, of those people who may not know the Quranic Arabic here, uh, there's it's in the Surah Ar-Rum, uh, is it Rum? Yeah. I think it's Surat Ar-Rum, the Surah of the Romans, where it says, Glory be to God when you enter into the evening and when you enter into the morning. So what we're doing now is you're entering into your evening, I'm entering into my morning. And we're saying, glorified be God. <laughs> so, let's carry on. Now, city. Bismillah. Yes, all right. Uh, so, uh, chapter two. The garden of the spirit. And for him that feareth, feareth the high degree of his Lord, there are two gardens. And beyond these are two other gardens. Therein are two fountains gushing. Therein is fruit, and the date palm, and the pomegranate. Quran, chapter 55, verse 46, 62, 66, and 68. Between the degree of human perfection and that of extinction in the divine perfection, there are said to be innumerable spiritual degrees whose multiplicity is sometimes represented by symbolic number, as is the multiplicity of the different heavens to which they correspond. Apart from considering universal man in the supreme truth, it is possible to consider him also according to his plenitude in one of these spiritual degrees. Thus, for example, it is said that on the night journey, when the Prophet was taken from Mecca to Jerusalem, and thence up through the next world to the divine presence, he met one other prophet in each of the seven heavens. For this does not mean that each of these prophets had only reached the heaven in which he was encountered, but that, as it were, below his extinction in the truth of certainty, his spirit is considered as presiding over that particular heaven in view of some special characteristic. The seven heavens together make up one of the paradises, which the chapter of the All-Merciful 
mentions in the above quoted verses as being of the number of four. According to the commentary, the two first mention of these paradises are the gardens of the soul and the heart, above which is the celestial paradise, the garden of the spirit, which comprises the seven heavens, and finally, the garden of the essence itself. When the archangel Gabriel appeared to the prophet on earth, he did so in the form of a man of the most marvelous beauty. For indeed, the human eye was not created to receive any more direct manifestation of the truth than this. Nor could the earth itself have endured the unmitigated presence of any heavenly power. But on the night journey, when the zenith of the seventh heaven had been reached, all the prophet's possibilities had been, as it were, reabsorbed into his supreme spiritual plenitude, which is named the light of Muhammad, and nurul Muhammadi. And with the eye of this light, he was able to look upon that which he had never seen before. And indeed, his sight now demanded no less an object of perception than the full unveiled glory of the archangel. Twice only did he behold this wonder, both times during the night journey. The first vision was just before the light of Muhammad was reabsorbed into the light of the essence, that is, just before his entry into the divine presence, before he and the archangel had begun their return journey in descent through the different heavens, that is, before the two splendors had begun to diminish. The second vision was on his re-emerging from the presence, before he and the archangel had begun their return journey in descent through the different heavens, that is, before the two splendors had begun to diminish, just as in an ascent, just as in a sense, they had gradually increased, each in proportion to the diminishment of the other's capacity for beholding. It is the full vision which is referred to in the following verses from the chapter of the star. And these verses express also universal man's direct consciousness that absolutely nothing is independent of the truth and that even the greatest glories of creation for all the apparently self-sufficient brightness are not in reality to be separated from the glory of the Creator. And verily he saw him at another revelation beside the low tree of the utmost boundary, whereby is the garden of refuge. When there enshrouded the low tree, that which enshrouded the sight wavered not, nor did it transgress. Verily he saw of the signs of his Lord, the greatest. Quran, chapter 53, verses 3 to 18. 13. But, uh, verses 13, 13 to 18. Yeah. In the words of the commentator, the low tree is a tree in the seventh heaven, which marks the boundary of the angel's knowledge. None of them knoweth what is beyond it. It is the Supreme Spirit, a Ruhul A'wam, above which there is nothing but the pure selfhood, al huwiya al huwiya He, the Prophet, was not veiled by it, the low tree, and its form, nor by Gabriel, in the fullness of his angelhood, from the truth, when it overflowed upon the low tree. And therefore he hath said, the sight wavered not by turning aside and looking at other than it, nor did it transgress through looking at itself and being veiled by the indi individuality. Right. Should we just have a, a break there? Because that's about halfway through this chapter and there are quite a lot of points that are being made that there may be questions concerning. Um, one thing I'd just like to do is to read out the note uh, 18 in my edition after the word transgress. It says here, 
that Dr. Ling says, the word transgress may be understood in the light of the utterance of Rabi'a al-Adawiyya. Thine existence is a sin wherewith no other sin can be compared. Wujuduka dhambun la yuqasu bihi dhamb. Your very existence is a sin. So Dr. Lings is trying to help us to understand that ma zagha al-basaru wa ma tagha in the Arabic. The sight didn't go from side to side. Wa ma tagha. Tagha, we get the, the, the idea word tarhut, rebellious uh, beings. Um, and so transgressing and rebelling in the, in the sense of tagha, Dr. Lings is saying that esoterically it could be understood that, of course, the prophet's sight couldn't be guilty of any, quote, transgression in the moral sense of the term, but only ontologically it can be related to that vision of oneself, which the commentator refers to, nor did it transgress through looking at itself and being veiled by the individuality. So just as it's a wonderful way of explaining this idea of, trans, of an ontological transgression as opposed to a moral transgression. The ontological transgression, transgression vis-a-vis -vis being and existence, uh, and here in Arabic we have the same word for both, wujud, but in English we have the advantage of saying that in existence is what stands apart from, ex stare, stands apart from being. So being is that which is, we exist, so we stand apart from being. And if we look at ourselves or have self-awareness or self-consciousness uh, as separate entities from being, then we have committed the worst of all sins compared as uh, described by Rabia and Adawiya. So this was a story a man came to Rabia and said, I haven't sinned for 30 years, something like that. He was boasting that he has given up his sins for 30 years. He stopped it. And then she said this great statement to him, which was one of the many kinds of statements that she made, which is why all the great scholars of her time would come just for a word of wisdom from her. And they would go off illuminated by just a few moments with her. And she was capable of giving these immediate uh, almost like repartee in spiritual terms um, and would show up the ignorance, spiritually speaking, of these people who were coming to see her and they would go off better aware of their own limitations. So this was when the man said, I haven't sinned for 30 years. And she said, your own existence is a sin compared to which no other sin, to which no other sin can be compared. So, if only you knew. So, I just wanted to make that point. And also just wanted to ask our participants if there are any questions arising out of what has just been read. Uh, no, I have I one, if I may. Oh, yeah. Please uh, say somebody else before me. What is the sound? Pardon? Oh no, I heard somebody, somebody else. I thought somebody Very else was going to. Um, uh, perhaps uh, uh, my question is a bit. Uh, it might be a bit. Uh, it's a bit uh, technical. Uh, it's regarding the word uh, Jannah uh, in Arabic. Uh, the translation uh, in in this book. Uh, the words heaven and uh, paradise uh, are used, uh, it seems like inter uh, interchangeably uh, right. to, to, uh, to interpret or, or as a substitute for uh, Jannah. 
So can you uh, explain, uh, can you uh, enlighten us uh, on this? Because uh, from the... Uh, Because in 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 our language, in Malay language, also have difficulty to actually to translate uh, the uh, the jannah into uh, uh, to find a, a word to translate jannah and of course uh, and heaven and paradise. So, what's the difference uh, actually? Uh, so, yeah, there is a distinction between uh, when Dr. Ling uses the word uh, heavens in the plural, he's always referring to the invisible heavens, the samawat. And those samawat are, are visible heavens that are symbols of corresponding degrees in paradise. Paradise conceived here as we have in the Surah Al-Rahman just now, two gardens and then another two gardens. And this is just one kind of tripart, uh, uh, um, quadripartite division, but... Um, as he said also in regard to the Isra and the Mi'raj, that the Prophet traversed seven of the heavens over which a particular Prophet presided, not because they were limited to that heaven symbolizing a degree in paradise, but only because this was that heaven that corresponded to a particular quality of their personality either their mission, their personality on earth, something that made, made them preside over that degree of... And we can see this in two ways, that, that degree of paradisal reality and that degree of spiritual realization. That's a very important point to get across as regards Kershani's... Remember, this commentary is called... Uh, Tafsir ibn Arabi, sometimes Tatwil ibn Arabi, Tatwilat. But in fact, it's Abdul Razak al Kershani, who was a hundred and something years later. Um, so, this is a very important point to realize regarding the um, perspective of Kershani that everything that is said about eschatology, about the paradisal degrees above and beyond us, is also to be understood as a symbol or a degree of spiritual realization within the soul. So this microcosmic interpretation uh, is called tatbiq in Arabic. The particular kind of tatwil he's doing is called tatbiq, which means correspondences. That what is it outwardly, like Joseph and his brothers, they correspond not only to the archetypes in paradise of the uh, the twelve, like the gardens that flow, the rivers that gush, but they also correspond to different faculties of the soul, and particularly when it comes to spiritual realization. Those bad things that Joseph's brothers did are the kind of whispering souls within us, the nafs al amara, and the uh, the receptivity for the hamazat of shaitan. Amazat is Shayateen, the Prophet. Uh, in, uh, in one surah, we're told to say, Qul a'udhu, wa qul rabbi a'udhu bika min hamazat is Shayateen, wa a'udhu bika rabbi an yaqburun. Say, O oh Lord, I seek refuge in you from the whisperings and insinuations and seductions of the Shayateen, of the demons. And I seek refuge in you, lest they be present with me. So those elements in the soul that are susceptible to these insinuations and whisperings and seductions of the demons are represented symbolically in the narrative of Joseph and his brothers by what they were brought to do against their own heart intellect. Joseph was the symbol of their own heart intellect, and they plotted against him, they were jealous, and they tried to kill him. That's a symbol for what we do whenever we become jealous of, of somebody else. What we're actually doing is trying to kill our own spirit. And um, that's how devastating it is for the spiritual life to be seduced into jealousy. So this is just one example. Now, as regards the degrees of paradise, Uh, 
the heaven, when Dr. Lins refers to heaven in the singular, it can be seen as being interchangeable with paradise, with the garden, with Jannah. Uh, but when he says the seven heavens, that's referring to the Samawat. So in English, we have to make sure that we don't confuse the cosmological idea of the heaven, the visible heavens, with the eschatological and um, posthumous, as it were, the, the reality of the garden that comes after death in eschatological terms um, and in ontological terms, which is a completely different degree of being altogether. And as regards the word Jannah itself, it, um, I think it means simply inclining to, um, to being hidden, to, to being concealed. It's so, and it's like that word mudhamatan that we have in the Surah Ar Rahman, describing the two higher gardens uh, as being mudhamatan. Mudhama is so green, so lusciously green, like what you have in your rainforests in Southeast Asia, so lusciously green that they appear to be dark. It's sort of inclining to blackness, as opposed to the two other gardens. Um, uh, oh, I forget what it is now. After the, the two first gardens, it talks about the Wata Afnam. Both of them have branches spreading out. So this is a good uh, preparation for us to understand the difference of degree uh, between the two sets of gardens. The two lower gardens have, are described immediately after being spoken about. They're described as having branches. These are the gardens, remember, of the soul and the heart. That particular degree of paradise which pertains to the soul and that particular degree which pertains to the heart. And later in this chapter and in subsequent ones, Dr. Lings will explain further how to understand these distinctions. Uh, but after the first two gardens are mentioned, um, we say we are told that these two gardens have branches outspread. And then it talks about the Wafihima Ainani Tajriyan. In both of these lower gardens, there are fountains flowing. Now, if you compare those two with what happens in the higher gardens, it's very, very illustrative. So the two higher gardens are described by Miduni Hima Jannatan. So these are not gardens that have trees with branches outspread. These are gardens that are described as being so lusciously green that they're tending unto darkness. So we're already getting a sense of being drawn into that mystery which is described by Solomon through the words of the Shulamite. I am black, but beautiful. We're already getting sense of Layla, of the night, of the essence. So yes, there's greenery, it's luscious, it's beautiful, but it's tending towards an even greater mystery, the glory of that light of the essence, which is so brilliant that it's a kind of a darkness in comparison to apparent light. And then the next thing about this is we also have the description of of flowing fountains, but those fountains are called uh, So there, uh, Nadakha. I forget exactly the root of that word, but I um, it's translated by Pigthor as as flowing in abundance. So whereas it's it's just a kind of ordinary flow, Tajriyan, Tajri min Taftahal Anhar. This one, Nadakhatan, is a kind of superabundance. 
So it'd be interesting to look up the exact meaning of that word, nadasha, to see how to understand it. So here you see we get a sense of the two sets of gardens with the same kind of things happening. They all they both have fruits, they both have huris, they both have um, these uh, fountains flowing, and they both have, they're both obviously gardens. But the way in which they're described helps you to see, to intuit the difference of degree between these two pairs of gardens. So the other, the other point, technical point, as it were, is about Siddhar, the Siddhar Tamuntaha. Apparently, this, this tree is related to the Zisiphus Hohoba and to the Zisiphus, which is called Spina Christi, Christ like spindles, because they say that this was the tree, or related to the tree, from which the crown of thorns of Jesus Christ was constructed. It's very interesting the symbolism here, because you may know that in the gospel, when Jesus speaks about his crucifixion that's coming up, he refers to it as the glorification of the Son of Man, saying, my glorification is soon coming. So, for, especially for the Eastern Orthodox Church, Jesus' crucifixion is coterminous with his glorification. It's tantamount to his glorification. Um, it's not so the Catholic point of view sees the, the, the full misery and the suffering, the grievous nature of the crucifixion. But for Jesus, for the Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox, they see the crucifixion in terms of, of the glorification. And it's very close to the, the Quranic idea, which in one of, the, one of the verses about the crucifixion said, they did not crucify him, but we raised him up to ourselves. We glorified him, in other words. So this crucifixion from the earthly point of view is a glorification from the celestial point of view and it's that point of view that the eastern orthodox affirm um, as opposed to just the crucifixion from the earthly point of view and also it's symbolic that the cross of jesus is effectively the wood from a tree and therefore the crown of thorns is like a representation of the sidra and therefore, it's like a connecting point that beyond this, this tree that also remember what Dr. Ling said from the commentary, that the Sidra al-Muntaha is the Ruh al-A'zam, al Ruh al-A'zam, the most tremendous, the supreme spirit. And if we ask, what is the name of Jesus, according to the Quran, Ruhullah, wa kalimatun minhu. So, and as you know, Jesus is referred to in the Sufi tradition particularly as Ruhullah, the Spirit of God, just as Moses is referred to as Kalim Allah, the one to whom God spoke, God's interlocutor, you might say, and as the Prophet himself is called Habibullah, the beloved or the friend of God, the lover of God. So let's keep these symbolic associations in our mind as we proceed. 